Are we having fun yet? <laughs> Just checking. Uh, thanks, thank you all for coming. I, I certainly want to thank the uh, Media Ecology Association for naming me the recipient of this year's uh, Post Neil Postman Award and for making it possible for me to be here with you today. Can you hear me? Is it okay? Okay, good. Um, Postman was uh, a hero of mine in the sense of being an honest and unsparing critic of American society, and I cite him a number of times in my own work. I always felt he had a natural talent for just saying, telling it like it is. I thought that was his strength, and I'm hoping that uh, I've been able to do something similar uh, in the following talk. That was my intent, anyway. In Praise of Shadows is the title of a little book by the celebrated Japanese author Junichiro Tanizaki, which he wrote in 1933. Tanizaki's particular focus in that book is how the West tends to emphasize such things as concrete objects and bright light, whereas the East is more interested in empty space and shadows. It's a brilliant, if somewhat idiosyncratic, essay, and Tanizaki's East-West dichotomy uh, remained with me for years after I first read the work. I should add that his intuitive take on the issue was subsequently confirmed by a number of empirical sociological studies, but that would be the subject of a separate lecture. In any case, I also want to talk about shadows today, but in a somewhat different context, not in terms of East and West, or East versus West, but rather in terms of depth versus surface. Um, although it turns out that this latter distinction does overlap a bit with uh, Tanizaki's, as I think will become apparent later on. The conflict I'm talking about occurred most sharply in the life of the Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, who spent the first half of his life as a Platonist and the second half as an anti-Platonist. I explored this curious contradiction in my book, Wandering God, and also in a poem I wrote a few years ago called Philosophical Investigations, which was published in a collection entitled Counting Blessings. Um, allow me to test your patience for just a few moments by reading it. Wandering through Wittgenstein's house in Vienna, the one he built for his sister, Margarete, you can't help thinking, this is the Tractatus in the form of a building. I mean, it's so austere, the masculine platonic lines and the purely functional doorknobs. Everything perfectly aligned down to the last millimeter. Wittgenstein did a complete flip in midlife, of course, deciding that the truth had to reside here on earth, not in heaven. Suddenly, it was all about context. I wonder what that house would look like. Couches with the stuffing coming out, maybe. Pigeons roosting on a window ledge, or even in the corner. A few friends sleeping on the floor, perhaps, clothes piled up in a heap. And lots of sex going on, too. Platonists need not apply. The first was a world without friction. The second had nothing but. Wittgenstein felt more at home in the second, often entertaining his philosophy class at Cambridge with examples from American detective stories. But the first world refused to let him go. There is, after all, something uncannily erotic about asceticism. The sense of the world must lie outside the world, he told a colleague the year before he died. In it, there is no value. It must lie outside all happening and being so. It must lie outside the world. He died in 1951, declaring that he had had a wonderful life. Sometimes I picture him as a pure spirit floating above the world, shyly wondering if he is, in fact, the meaning of it. The dichotomy is something like this. In Book 7 of The Republic, Plato imagines a scenario in which people are sitting around in a cave staring at shadows on the wall in front of them. They take these shadows to be reality. But at some point, one member of the group leaves the cave and discovers a brilliant light located behind the shadow watchers, which is the source of what they see on the wall. They are, he realizes, mistaking the shadows for reality our task, says Plato, is to leave the cave and become acquainted with the light, to sort out the real from the unreal. Unfortunately, he goes on, very few human beings are capable of doing this. What might be examples of this phenomenon? 
a phenomenon I like to call vertical. We believe that the objects around us with their physical properties of density, color, texture, and so on are real. But read a few pages of any contemporary physics book and you will discover that the true reality is atomic particles in empty space, as Democritus asserted a long time ago. Or we believe that human beings are basically rational, that they make decisions based on objective information. But read a few pages of any contemporary psychology text and you'll discover that a good part of the time we're in the grip of drives, instincts, and unconscious forces that have their origins in early childhood. Third example, most Americans believe that the two major political parties in the United States are poles apart, offering very different conceptions of the good life. But a serious examination of their respective histories reveals differences only in terms of style, not substance. Empire versus empire light, as the Canadian writer Michael Ignatieff once put it. Franklin Roosevelt's historical role, for example, was to save capitalism, not destroy it, as his enemies still believe. Virtually all American historians agree with that assessment. That, in any case, is the light behind the shadows approach the vertical argument, and it does illuminate quite a lot, it seems to me. It's a very powerful methodology. But the approach of the horizontal school, as exemplified by the later Wittgenstein and phenomenologists such as Maurice Merleau-Ponty, is rather different. What it says is that there is no light, that it's all shadows, and the shadows happen to be fully real. Depths are on the surface, as Wittgenstein put it. What you see is what you get. The general, the gross physical body, said Merleau-Ponty, is the reality. It's much more than a collection of atoms. It suffers, it experiences sexual desire, and it sends subliminal messages to other bodies. It's hardly a mechanical assemblage of parts. To take the example of politics once again, in terms of vertical analysis, it clean, seems clear enough by now who the real Mr. Obama is. He's the man who appointed as his economic advisors individuals who were espousing the very neoliberal ideology that led to the crash of 2008. And the man who ignored the plight of the poor and the unemployed after that crash, and instead funneled upwards of $19 trillion into the hands of Wall Street bankers, who subsequently gave themselves huge bonuses that he publicly approved of. He's the man who decried the senseless slaughter of children in Newtown, Connecticut last December while sending predator drones to Afghanistan and Pakistan, which just happened to murder children on a regular basis. According to the New York Times, the president holds Terror Tuesdays meetings with his national security advisors every week, during which time they discuss which suspected terrorists should be assassinated by drones. In one third of these cases, says the Times, Mr. Obama selects the targets himself, targets that have included American citizens. He talks of the great freedom enjoyed by citizens of our democracy and at the same time aggressively persecutes whistleblowers and has his intelligence agencies collecting information on virtually every man, woman, and child in the United States as very recent revelations have shown. An analysis of this year's State of the Union Address by Seamus Cook, this was in Counterpunch, at the website Counterpunch, 19th of February, showed how that speech was coded so that the corporate elite would understand that they would be increasingly in control of American society. To conclude that the president is basically a corporate and military shill, despite the veneer of faint liberal rhetoric that he occasionally comes out with, is hardly rocket science at this point. This is what a vertical analysis tells us. However, if we look at Obama horizontally as a real shadow, so to speak, I think we discover a much subtler reality. Who is Barack Obama, in fact? If you look into his eyes through the medium of television and newspaper photographs, you see a certain type of vacancy there. Rhetoric, after all, is just rhetoric. Beyond, behind it lies an empty person. He's chic, he's poised, and in a spiritual sense, he stands for nothing at all. New York Times columnist Ross Douthat captured this quite accurately when he wrote just last month that Obama, Obama is basically a performance. The man is a shell. He lacks 
an inner moral compass, which is why Wall Street and the Pentagon and the NSA were able to seduce him so easily. Since he's an empty vessel, he was quickly filled up with the agendas of the wealthy and the powerful, such that even genocide is now part of his own agenda. Of course, the type of vacancy I'm talking about can be seen in the eyes of Mr. Clinton, Bush Jr. And C or Sr., or Mitt Romney. Remember that guy? He was little more than a walking haircut. I mean, he was one of the most silliest people to ever walk on to the American political stage, you know. What does it mean, however, that the American people want hollow men, as T.S. Eliot once put it, to represent them? Romney, after all, gained 47% of the popular vote. As the comedian George Carlin once put it, where do you think our leaders come from, Mars? This finally takes us into media ecology, the larger picture, because horizontal analysis goes way beyond merely identifying these individuals as the mouthpieces of the rich and powerful. They are, but they are also the mouthpieces of nearly everyone else in the United States, which is why they get elected to office and why the, ch why the choice always boils down to Tweedledum versus Tweedledee. What American, for example, doesn't buy into the American dream? Why do soup kitchens and tent cities across the United States fly the American flag above them in a strange parody of patriotism? As John, Steinbe John Steinbeck put it many years ago, in the United States, the poor regard themselves as temporarily embarrassed millionaires. And I, as I argue on why America failed, the goal, the goal of the settlers on the North American continent as far back as the late 16th century has been capital accumulation, the pursuit of happiness, as Thomas Jefferson subsequently called it. In March of last year, the Pew Charitable Trust released the results of a poll that revealed that most Americans have no objection to the existence of a small, wealthy elite, the famous 1%. Not at all. Their goal is to become part of that elite. <laughs> and they're deluded enough to think that they can do it. This is one reason why the Occupy Wall Street movement had such a short lease on life and why social equality was a non-issue in the last presidential election, not even mentioned in the pre-election debates. Rich or poor, nearly every American wants to be rich and in fact sees this as the purpose of life. In this sense, we have the purest democracy in the history of the world because ideologically speaking, the American government and the American people are on the same page. To quote Calvin Coolidge, the business of America is business. Hustling is what America has always been about. This is why our elected leaders have a vacant quality about them. After all, the American dream is about a world without limits, about always having more. But more is not a spiritual path, nor is it a philosophy of life. It has no content at all. And this is why when you look into the eyes of an Obama or a Clinton or a Hillary Clinton, probably our next president, you see not merely nothing, but a kind of terrifying nothingness. Unfortunately, this vacant look characterizes a lot of the American population as well. The microcosm reflects the macrocosm, as the medieval alchemists were fond of saying. Once again, this is evidence of a pure democracy. Nobody's elect nobody's to office, and then everyone wonders, quote, what went wrong? All of this reflects the power of horizontal understanding. Again, what you see is what you get. Let me dwell just a moment on this business of the emptiness of American life, because I think it really goes to the heart of the matter. I first became aware of the reality of this phenomenon in the late 70s. I was living in uh, San Francisco at the time. Some art gallery mounted a collection of photographs of anonymous European faces from the 20s and the 30s. And what struck me as I went through that exhibition was the depth and the complexity of those faces and how different they were from American faces, which tend to be rather bland. I began to notice this more and more as the years went on. Then last month, as it turns out, I happened to be in Barcelona for a few weeks, and the Museum of Modern European Art hosted an exhibition of 20th century Catalan sculpture, most of it consisting of busts of ordinary people. And again, one sees a real presence in these faces, a real self-awareness. There's no mistaking it. Finally, the very next day after that, I went to Makba, the Museum of Contemporary Art, and discovered that there was a collection of portraits on display by the English photographer Craigie Horsfield, 
of People in Barcelona in 1996, for which Orsfield was nominated for the Turner Prize. Once again, the sense of an inner life was so dramatically present in the eyes and expressions of these folks, and someone, perhaps the curator of the exhibition, wrote of Horsfield's work, his individual portraits remind us of the configuration of a civil society in which dissent remains as alive as ever. I immediately flashed on the film Compliance. I don't know if you folks have seen this. It came out last year, but run, don't walk to your nearest blockbuster or whatever and rent the DVD or buy it. It's a fictional reconstruction of an event that took place more than 70 times in more than 30 states in which someone impersonated a police officer over the phone and then got his fellow Americans to unquestionably, unquestioningly do whatever he asked, no matter how outrageous or degrading. You really have to see this film. It's quite unusual. This is a sad x-ray of the American psyche, it seems to me, revealing the complete absence of an inner voice. At the end of the movie, the woman who caused the most damage as a result of her blind obedience is interviewed on television, and all she wants to talk about is the weather in New Orleans. What else would one expect in a nation in which the cultural icons are not Garcia Lorca or Picasso, but Tony Robbins and Donald Trump? A nation that, to quote Barbara Ehrenreich, is vapidly bright-sided thinks Oprah is a sage, and has literally no understanding of the tragic dimensions of life. A nation whose people wear smiley buttons and constantly tell each other to have a nice day. No vertical analysis is required here. The reality of our situation is staring us in the face. Thomas Young, a dying Iraq war veteran, put it this way in a letter he wrote to Bush and Cheney, your positions of authority, your millions of dollars of personal wealth, your public relations consultants, your privilege and power cannot mask the hollowness of your character. The problem with the philosophy of more is that more, as already noted, doesn't have any intrinsic meaning. After all, once you have it, then you want more. That's the American dream. But the awareness of this dynamic, assuming we ever get to the point of awareness, puts us in a particular bind, at least as far as serious social change is concerned. We are finally talking about a kind of conversion experience. And beyond the individual level, which is itself no small achievement, that can only happen when history presents us with a no-win situation. The bald fact is that we cannot maintain the American dream, now foolishly being pursued by the Chinese because we are running out of resources, oil in particular. The American dream cannot survive without energy and lots of it. Our conversion to a different mental outlook will thus come in the form of a crunch in which the subdued lights and the quiet shadows, I mean this in Tanizaki's sense, that is a kind of austerity or Zen restraint, will get praised because we can no longer afford to have the bright lights burning 24-7. The Russian-American sociologist Peterim Sorokin called this the shift from a sensate culture to an ideational one. And it is this shift that we are not now caught up in. If history is any guide, it won't be a whole lot of fun. Because when you have been doing something for a long time, it becomes very hard to shift gears. I suspect it's a little like detoxing from heroin. But there could be a few benefits as well so let me conclude by suggesting what they might be. First, under the American dream, people waste their lives by never being present in them. To quote George Carlin once again, they call it the American dream because you've got to be asleep to believe it. Since the goal is more, real life is always seen as being on the horizon, always about to start at some future point. It's an absurd way to live when you think about it. One reason I moved to Mexico several years ago is that despite the heavy Americanization of Mexican society, there still remains the vestige, the ambiance of a traditional culture, one not try constantly trying to get somewhere. Americans tend to laugh at this manana culture, but I doubt they're gonna have the last laugh. The truth is that they don't know what they're missing, and it should come as no surprise 
that the U.S. consistently ranks below Mexico in world happiness polls. Most days for me begin by getting up, making myself a cup of tea, and sitting on the couch and staring at the space for an hour, thinking about absolutely nothing at all. I can't really describe the pleasure of this wu wei, as it is called in Chinese philosophy, this non-doing, except to say that I wish it for all of us. The freedom from an agenda may be one of the greatest freedoms around. Secondly, as the consumer society and the American dream continue to disintegrate, many will experience a severe crisis of meaning inasmuch as prior to the crunch, meaning was to be found in the latest technological gadget or piece of software or brand of lip gloss or whatever. I see lots of nervous breakdowns on the horizon. But as one droll observer once put it, the trick, trick is to convert a nervous breakdown into a nervous breakthrough. After all, 20th century life offered human beings in the West, at least, a set number of master narratives, communism, fascism, and consumerism primarily, so that they might be able to avoid the most terrifying question of all, who am I? As the I Ching tells us, crisis means danger plus opportunity. Wouldn't it be great to discover that one was more than one's career, for example, or one's car? That opportunity is going to present itself sooner or later. For many, it already has. Third, along with all this, there might be a shift in the definition of happiness. Now, there's an interesting thought. The damage that the American way of life has done to community, friendship, sexual relations, daily social interaction, the family, the workplace, and the nature of work itself is colossal. This loss has been documented in volume after volume of studies of contemporary American society, most famously, I suppose, in Robert Putnam's book of 2000, Bowling Alone, although I have to say that in a qualitative sense, Neil Postman anticipated Professor Putnam's statistical findings by quite a few years. In any case, we now have many such studies at our disposal, including novels such as Freedom by Jonathan Franzen, a depressing book that shows that we have no real freedom at all. There are also a number of stunning films on the costs of this way of life, such as Margin Call with Jeremy Irons, or Up in the Air with George Clooney, or Compliance, which I already referred to. A good deal of modern American culture, writes Thomas Lewis in his book, A General Theory of Love, is an extended experiment in the effects of depriving people of what they crave most. Let me repeat that. A good deal of modern American culture is an extended experiment in the effects of depriving people of what they crave most. That the systemic, systematic destruction of all these things, community, friendship, and so on, might come to an end is, in my view, a cause for celebration. In fact, for some Americans, at least, it might mean the return of what it means to be human. Typically, neighbors in the United States have no relationship with each other. They don't even know each other's names. Children barely see their parents, who throw money at them if they have money to throw, in lieu of loving them or even talking to them. None of this, I wish to point out, requires vertical analysis. These things speak for themselves, as, for example, Franzen's novel makes abundantly clear. They say as much about the vapidity of American life as the vacant look in the president's eyes or the empty rhetoric of his speeches. You get my point. In any case, these are some of the benefits that we might receive if and when the current way of life can no longer be maintained. Taken as a whole, they add up to the remark made 150 years ago by the Victorian art critic and social reformer John Ruskin, whom Mahatma Gandhi called the single greatest influence on his way of thinking. There is no wealth but life. Gandhi's version of this was, I have no message. My life is my message. Ruskin would have agreed with both Wittgenstein and Tanizaki, I suspect, that it's the shadows that have the most to teach us. Thank you. So if you folks have any questions or comments, I'd be glad to entertain them. Sure. So you began with Plato, and I know in your Twilight of American Culture, you talked about the monistic option, and that people should, in some way, sort of prepare for the worst, and 
move toward a more monistic lifestyle. But with Plato beginning, I'm wondering to what extent do you see democracy as the problem and do you, would you advocate something like a benevolent dictator? Yeah, it, it really is a, a good question because um, democracy in a certain sense, past, past a certain point, gets into a crisis. Aristotle pointed this out and de Tocqueville mentioned that uh, democracy can only work if the population is fairly intelligent and we don't have that. So this is, it's coming to apart at the seams. How do, I'm not particularly an advocate of taking the system and somehow fixing it because I don't think history works that way. So even if there were a benevolent dictator running the show, I mean, in limited sense, it might work. For example, during World War II, Franklin Roosevelt turned to General Motors and Ford and so on and said, you're not manufacturing cars anymore. For the next three years, you're manufacturing uh, tanks and materiel. Then we'll talk about cars. And I don't want to hear any baloney about it either. You know, I mean, that was benevolent dictatorship, and we needed to do that. In a limited sense, that might be OK. But in terms of reorganizing a whole civilization, it's quite impossible. It's quite impossible. And so in terms of scenarios for social change, honestly, I think this just has to play out, democracy and all. It simply has to play out. At the end of that, uh, there will be, the, the situation will be so dysfunctional that all the alternative experiments that have been going on with alternative energy, alternative currencies, and so on. And some countries have quite a few. Spain has like 325 experiments of this nature. Those things will become more and more attractive. It's, the analogy I would make is to take the title from Johann Hausinger, The Waning of the Middle Ages. We are now in the waning of the modern ages. That's what's happening. And what Hausinger pointed out was that that period which lasted, in that case, about 200 years, was a very depressed one psychologically because people lost their moorings. And that's what's happening today. It won't take 200 years in our case, but things are just too speeded up now. But it, we are entering a period of people being completely dislocated and just doing more of the same. That's all they know how to do. You know, um, So I think it will eventually play out. I call this a dual process, that as capitalism comes apart, what you have is the emergence of these alternative experiments. And more and more, they will become the new socioeconomic formation. But this is just a guess. I don't have a crystal ball. And when I went to graduate school, it, excuse me, it was in history rather than prophecy. So, you know, I mean, I'm just giving a, the most likely scenario I can think of because I don't think that the notion of grasping the situation and doing, you know, actively doing something about it can be done. I just don't think that's possible. Yes, sir. Um, would you mind repeating the uh, phrase one more time about the private people? Oh, yeah. OK. The title of that book, it's, and it's an edited book by uh, Thomas Lewis. The title of the book is A General Theory of Love. And he writes, a good deal of modern American culture is an extended experiment in the effects of depriving people of what they crave most. In other words, what we are channeled into by this system is substitute satisfaction. Because what human beings want is what they've always wanted. Community, friendship, sex, interesting things to think about, safety, I, those things are permanent. And what this system does is it takes those away and says, here, here's a cell phone. Here's lip gloss. Here's television. It gives you stuff that basically is crap. And it says you'll be happy with that. And generally, people aren't on some level. And that's part of the, the crisis, really. Yes, sir. Well, I mean, the West is what it is. You know, I mean, it's not China and it's not Japan. Um, last year, I spent more than six weeks in Japan 
Um, this is a society with a lot of problems, as I'm sure you know. Uh, but it also has some things that are absolutely remarkable about it. Um, at the time of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster, there was a situation in which 40 workers were trapped in a single room overnight. It was freezing cold, and there was one cup of ramen to go around. There was no fighting. There was no discussion about it. They just passed it. Everybody took a spoonful, and that's how they survived that night. One commentator on this said, I can't imagine another nation in which such a thing would take place. Certainly, it wouldn't be the United States. They'd be clawing each other's eyes out for the ramen. So there are things that we can learn, but whether we could adapt them, I don't know. What I do know from my study of history is that the midwife is always force. When you have no choice, that's when you do something different. If we're going to move to Buddhist economics, it's because there is no other choice. So then the Japanese will look very good. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden it'll be very attractive and we'll be in praise of shadows. That's what we'll be doing. We'll make a virtue out of necessity. But the, uh, that, that we could adopt another system in a real way, I don't think is very likely. You know, um, I can't remember his name. Soki An, I think, came to the United States in 1945. He was the first Buddhist monk to arrive in the United States, set up a center, and try to teach Americans Buddhism. And after a while, he said, you know, it's like taking a plant and sticking it next to a rock and expecting the thing to take root. It didn't work. What happened with the flirtation with Buddhism in the United States in the 60s and 70s was it got filtered through the American competitive system. So basically, you had um, Zen, I mean, I sat Zazen in San Francisco for two years with Richard Baker. Meanwhile, Baker was sleeping with all the female disciples and had to have a Mercedes to drive around in, you know. And that culture of American Buddhism was, my guru is better than your guru, you know. That's not the idea of Buddhism. But you see what I mean? It comes through an American filter and, and it comes out something different. So the possibility, I think, of seriously integrating something like that into our system can't open up as long as it's a trend or it's chic or it's fetish. It can only open up when there is no other choice. You know? But I think that day will, will come. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a great question. What's happened over the last 10 years is a very strange thing in media ecology. Hard copy press and television is largely worthless. They are not telling you what is going on. The function of the New York Times is to make a professional, middle class, comfortable, and feel that everything's okay. It's not all the news that f it's fit to print. It's all the news that fits our views. That's the true motto of the New York Times. And so when you read the editorial, I mean, I can write you, a, you just name the subject, and I can write you a Wall Street Journal editorial with my eyes closed. I can use their phrases. Believe me, it takes no talent at all. They just grind them out like this. There is no real information in these sources. So where are they? They're largely in online websites like Common Dreams, Truth Dig, Truth Out, um, Alternet, um, Counterpunch, and a whole series of websites that have emerged in the last 10 or 15 years in which the journalists are not regurgitating what they're supposed to do, but they actually do investigative journalism and then report it, which is what newspapers did in the United States in the 19th century, part of the 20th. So we now have a two-tiered kind of situation where if you want to feel that basically the United States is on the right track and everything's okay, then you read the Post and, and the Times and so on. 
If you want to understand what's actually happening in the culture, you have to go to those alternative websites. The problem is that most Americans are unaware that they exist. I mean, their readership or whatever, you know, visualship, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, is vanishingly small. And this creates a problem uh, precisely at Plato's Cave, that the number of people who are actually interested in analysis and the nature of the American narrative and how it's coming apart and so on and so forth, maybe in a nation of 315 million people, maybe that amounts to 200,000. Well, that 200,000 is not going to change anything. All they can do is watch the lemmings go off the cliff. Still, you know, it's entertaining. You might as well watch. What the heck? You got something better to do? You know. Sir? It might make a difference in terms of those ex alternative experiments I talked about. That it might make a difference. No, we can't. This is what we're watching is a Abrams tank going off a cliff. That's what we're largely watching. You will not stop that. I mean, that's not going to be stopped. But you can work toward creating serious intelligent alternatives to the, the tank life. And that's where the awareness of other people and the numbers become important, you know? I mean, I have to tell you that I have been absolutely amazed at the reporting that goes on at these alternative websites. They take my breath away. <laughs> Whereas the New York Times is sitting around and picking its nose. These people go out in the field, they interview people, they come back with the stories and they write them up. It's real journalism. New York Times isn't doing real journalism. So the question is, if enough people then start to become aware of that, then they might engage in those alternative experiments. That could change the, the it won't, it won't uh, prevent the disaster, but it could make uh, an alternative socioeconomic formation more likely to occur and, and perhaps more intelligently. Sir. Try and squeeze a little optimism out of you. What the heck? Let's give it a shot. Uh, Many brave men have tried. <laughs> no, you're not as brave as me. Do it. Uh, what about our youth? You're talking about old people like ourselves, the people that run the New York Times, run the big corporations. Do you feel that the new digital media? which are producing a new kind of mindset among our young people, talk about the digital natives, is there any hope that they can change this system before the tank goes over the cliff? Uh, no, there is no hope they can. Um, the, the problem with the youth is that the nature of this technology has largely colonized their minds. The studies now of the damage that this technology does to the brain, to synaptic con connections and all that, is quite quite heavy. Check out the footnotes in Nicholas Carr's book, The Shallows, for example. That's a shallow book. Yeah, but he has good footnotes. And the footnotes refer to research that's been done by lots of people that's very, very good. And what you now have is, for example, every time there's an introduction of a new technology or a new methodology, like multitasking, everybody goes nuts. Oh, we'll all multitask. 10 years later, it turned out that multitasking slows the brain down. And actually, one industrial expert um, calculated that in a single year, it cost uh, American industry, multitasking it cost American industry more than $600 billion. Um, there's a problem with that, the nature of digital technology that changes the mind. Um, books that are read that are print are read in a very different way than books that are read on screens. This has been established too. People who read screens scan 
And people who read books sit and think about what's on the page. This is a big difference. Young people are not interested, I can't make generalization for all, but it seems to me that an awful lot are very excited about the new digital technologies. It's new, it's cool, it's hip, and so on, and it's making them dumber and dumber. So I don't see a lot of possibilities in those directions. Um, you know, um, a friend of mine who's a journalist uh, gave a talk on U.S. foreign policy at um, Occupy Wall Street in Washington a couple years ago, and he said that his audience consisted of about 60 people, um, and he looked around, and there were only two people in that audience that were under 60 years of age, as far as he could determine. In other words, there is not a thirst except for a very small percentage, there's not a thirst for the type of analysis that used to go on when I was in high school, let alone college. There's just not that ability anymore. And frankly, as my academic career wound down and the years went by toward the end, I was quite glad to get out. As, as my academic career wound up, I saw in the papers that were being turned in less and less of an ability to write coherently, to spell, and above all, to understand the difference between opinion and argument. They just didn't get it. If they felt something, it was true. That's all they knew. If I said, well, what's the evidence for this? They would just stare at me. What do you mean? Um, this is not a likely source. I think. I mean, where it's going to come from is an interesting question, but I don't think it will be a question of age. It's a question of exposure and sensibility and other things. Um, age, I don't think, is a predictor right now of avant-garde, myself. Somebody in the back, yeah. You, you have asked, you framed this in a dystopic, utopic manner, fairly straightforwardly, and there's even a sort of apocalyptic vector in mm. this. Yeah, the trouble is I don't know what that means. In other words, when you say a move, uh, I don't know how to address that or how to evaluate it. Um, it's, uh, it's, we are living in a situation, I think, that's like what Housinger says for the late Middle Ages. Um, whether there will be, I don't, uh, incidentally, I don't think there will be a utopia on the horizon, not at all. Um, there will be a different social formation, and you know what? That will have its problems, too. <laughs> Don't kid yourself. Uh, but the, the thing is that there may be moves that, I don't know, if you say just a move, to me it means, well, it's inconsequential or doesn't have any particular effect. Sure, there'll probably be a lot of, quote, moves. But the moves I'm interested in are the ones that might be able to transfigure or transform the situation that we're in or move to a different state in which um, a lot of the problems that we have uh, will be mitigated. Again, that doesn't mean there won't be problems. Um, I have a feeling that um, in a decentralized uh, alternative energy, eco, you know, eco-sustainable world, there will be you know, recycling police that will come around and drive you nuts about whether you, you know, sorted out your garbage. There will be all kinds of problems that will emerge. There will be no utopia. I'm not in that framework. Um, but what I am just looking at is, is, what's the course of it? The World Systems Analysis School, Emmanuel Wallerstein, Christopher Chase Dunn, all those people, talk about the arc of capitalism as having started around 1500 AD in seriousness and running about 600 years. In other words, the story of this century is the unraveling 
of that socioeconomic formation. But Wallerstein, he wrote a book 20 years ago called Ut Utopistics. At the end of it, he doesn't say that we will necessarily have a better world. There are no guarantees. Uh, I think it will be a different one, but uh, there will be serious drawbacks to any, we're, we're human beings, you know, there will be serious drawbacks to any formation that we have. And, um, you know, I, I tend to agree with uh, Kant that uh, from the crooked timber of humanity, uh, no straight thing was ever made. You know, there's better and there's worse. I mean, that, that's how I would approach it. Fall in the back. I appreciate you mentioning uh, Ross Delman, who does want to be That's right. Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. I, I read um, McIntyre many years ago, I think really right around the time when it came out. And um, it's, at that time, my feeling was it was hard to warm to a scholastic or Aristotelian world, you know, uh, although I appreciated what he was talking about. But it's kind of funny because I completely forgot about that, at least consciously, when I sat down and I wrote The Twilight of American Culture and talked about the new monastic option. But it seemed to me that it, there was no way of, he seemed to be talking about a total transformation of culture. I, I didn't see that as possible. What I saw was pockets of alternatives. Um, the depressing scenario for that would be Brave New World, where you have you know, the natives, so to speak, living on the margins of society and living a different type of life than the mainstream. We may wind up in that situation. Frankly, I hope not. I hope that those alternatives amount to something that's more positive, you know. But it, it's a good question, but it's kind of curious because when I wrote that, I had forgotten about McIntyre entirely. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, urban farming, things of that nature. Right. And I'd be, I may be selectively attending to more of this, but it seems that that's getting a little bit of an uptake, um, alternative energy sources in terms of I'm getting emails you know, from certain subscribers to, okay, don't go through your current electric company. Mm -hmm. We'll donate to this, that, or the other thing. I'm wondering if you think that this is a viable sort of alternative, one of these alternatives that you talk about. Yeah, I. I think, thank you, I, I think we've got to do it. My general feeling is that we will repeat the Roman experience in which the revival, which was the urban revival of the 10th century, took place in Northern Europe and not in Rome. In other words, if there's a revival, I don't think it's gonna happen on American soil. However, however, that being said, one of my closest friends, Joel Magnuson, just published a book called The Approaching Great Transformation in which he went around the United States and he interviewed people that were doing these alternative experiments. And it's a very perceptive book because he identifies the ones that talk trendy, holistic stuff, but basically it's just for profit. You know, it's sort of like, you know, Thomas Friedman or Al Gore Green, you know, while hundreds of millions of dollars are pouring into their bank accounts, you know, uh, corporate green. Um, but he did on identify a few experiments that were serious, that were um, not for profit, not for expanding the economy, but for serving the community. Um, and so that struck me, I mean, it just struck me as a wonderful project to undertake, to at least search out to see what there are. It's pitifully small compared to Europe, but it's there. It's there and it might leave a trace. Not all of these experiments have to go the way of Ben and Jerry's, you know, so, yes, sir.
Uh, with Wallerstein, he does talk about a 50-year black period of, uh, out of which he thinks a new system will emerge. And, it, and, it, uh, and this black period being intense political and cultural struggle. Uh, and he thought it was important to retain the, the modern, two modernities, modernity of uh, liberation and the other one I can't remember. Uh, so he has, I think, a kind of a lining of moving forward in a moving through a, a bad period of moving out of it and something. So I, my impression was he thought it would be better. <coughs> Sorry? My impression was that he thought it would be a better system than modernity. The end of modernity was a good thing, and something better would emerge. And I will talk, in his pessimism, he talks about an anarchy in technological society. It really is based on his notion of Christianity, a kind of theological mm. uh, optimism. And I was wondering if you had anything in your thinking that was comparable to either of those kind of scenes of moving through in a better way or whether it's just moving down Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Look, as far as Alul goes and technological determinism, I mean, I always took the position that uh, technology, with McLuhan, that technology was not value neutral, that that was ridiculous. That if you introduce the technology to a culture, you introduce the, the culture's values to that culture, I mean, where it came from, and that that was going to inoculate and infect, basically, that culture. Um, I had a, now, whether this can be generalized or not, I don't know, it goes back to this gentleman's question earlier. Um, quite a shock when I was in Japan last year and discovered that although the Japanese text all the time, they sit on subways and text and so on, they don't talk on their phones in public. That was quite a shock. In fact, if you ride the Tokyo subway, there's an image of a cell phone and superimposed on it in English, block capitals, the word off. The Japanese are very sensitive about bothering other people in public. They're very considerate of how the other person is receiving whatever's happening. Um, I remember being in a cafe and uh, a woman's cell phone rang. She immediately took it out, also took out a small towel, put it over the mouthpiece and over her mouth and talked in such a low way that nobody could hear. The idea is that you don't bother other people. In the United States, it's very common that I'll be in a restaurant three feet away, a woman is yelling into her cell phone about the details of her gallbladder operation, <laughs> which I really wanted to know. Um, we are not considerate, and the technology basically makes us just more obnoxious. In Japan, the culture of group psychology, which is very strong there, is actually able to contain that technology. So this was the first time I had it right in my face that maybe technological determinism is not so deterministic. That's number one. As far as Wallerstein goes, I really do, I can't say, I can't think of how we're not going to go through a period of darkness and anarchy. I can't imagine how, you don't get a new socioeconomic formation for free. That's not how history works. You have to pay for it. And I can't imagine that there will not be the rise of not only in our anarchist movements, but secessionist movements, which actually I see as a good thing, um, but also this kind of minority scapegoating, especially of Hispanics that we now see with you know the border and so on. Um, because as things get chaotic and most people don't understand what's going on, they find targets for their anxiety. So I think we're headed for a rough time. In addition, uh, just recently, this is kind of interesting because um, about a year ago, I, I wrote Chris Hedges about um, the fact that if there's going to be a real severe ecological crunch, there's going to be mass migrations within the United States uh, and a lot of panic as the ether grid or the electrical grid breaks down and so on. Um, and that my guess was that the Pentagon, this is like a year ago, that the Pentagon had uh, in place scenarios for what to do to control populations. Um, Chris wrote back and he said, I have no doubt that that's true. So I wrote back and I said, frankly, I'm guessing that they're doing actual training exercises in the Nevada desert right now. 
you think you can find out about it? He said, I'll try. Well, just a few weeks ago, there was a report released. I think Glenn Greenwald wrote the article. Again, it was an alternate or something like this. But it's basically about what the Pentagon has been doing, including uh, training exercises in the Nevada desert to get ready for crowd and riot control. In other words, what happens when the system breaks down? They're going to be, there's going to be the army on every street corner in the United States. You can count on it. And so I think that kind of thing lies in our future. But I don't think it's necessarily a permanent condition. I mean, we will have to go through a pretty rocky time, and I, I, I expect that's going to happen. But it's not going to be the end of history, you know. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, I mean, in, uh, in uh, Twilight of American Culture, I talk about the new monastic option and that basically uh, people can start cultivating on their own the preservation of what's best in American civilization um, and trying to preserve it. But it doesn't preclude those people contacting other people. <laughs> it's just that if it's going to be done virtually, you might as well not bother. It has to be bodies. It has to be phys people physically relating to one, one another. Harvard just initiated this MOOC program where they're going to put all of their courses online so that 100, you know, it's a lot of money in it, 150,000 people can watch. That's the most worthless type of education imaginable. It's totally unembodied. It will amount to nothing. Um, let them do it. It's largely for corporate purposes. It has nothing to do with education, regardless of what they say. So these things that are going to work are going to have to be people physically getting together and talking. And sometimes people, you know, I mean, how that's going to play out in terms of larger connections, I don't know. But that's how things get preserved or how, uh, you know, things get changed. French Revolution did not need cell phones. Not at all. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, I don't know, offhand it's hard to say how that will play out, really, because um, it's, uh, to me, that's always an individual decision, you know. Um, and it's a question of what people might seize on in terms of uh, theological targets uh, offhand if my guess is not that this would necessarily be a good thing but my guess is that if we're talking about the emergence of you know an eco-sustainable alternative energy blah blah it will be something about the earth it will focus on the earth um, and whether that will take a pagan form you know I have no, I have no idea but um, one thing I'm absolutely sure of, the issue of religion and spirituality will never, ever go away. Not ever. Uh, I was impressed by the future of an illusion by Freud, but even more impressed by a Jungian reviewer of that book who said, if Freud thinks that uh, religion is going to be given up at some point, that's the greatest illusion of all. You know, it won't happen. So there will be some kind of organization around that. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, that has positive and negative aspects to it. Anybody else? All right, well, listen, thank you all for coming. I hope I didn't depress you too much, but, you know, okay. <laughs>